Hi, I want to talk a little bit about transcription today, give you a chance to think through some of the issues that go along with transcription. It's one of those things that we oftentimes tend to overlook. We forget about transcription as a process and how important it really is. Sometimes there's a certain sense of dread about having to do the transcription. Uh, and I can certainly understand it. There's often a lot to have to do, especially if you're doing interviews, but it's a really important process within qualitative research. So it's important that we take a minute to think about exactly how we're going to make the decisions about how to do the transcription. The first thing we want to ask ourselves is why is it that we actually transcribe? Maybe take a second here, pause the video, and think about why it is you you want to transcribe the things that you're going to transcribe. Well, one of the things that you might think about with why you want to transcribe is that you have to actually get the words and actions that go on out in the social world onto a page. Of course, when we publish things within research, we have to actually publish them on paper or on a screen and in order to be able to get the social world onto that format, we actually have to transcribe what we're doing. The next question is, okay, well, if we want to get things onto paper, what is it about the social world that can actually be captured by a transcript? This might be a good opportunity for you to pause the video again and think a little bit about what it is we can put into a transcript. Well, you might have thought about a number of different things that can go in there. Of course, speech is the one that we think of most often, but there's so much more than speech that we can put into a transcript. Gestures, movements, events that go on outside of it, all those kinds of things can be captured in a transcript in addition to qualities of the speech that we're recording. So things like pauses, intonation, uh, volume, pitch, all of those kinds of things we can put into a transcript. Well, since we can put so many things into a transcript, the next question is, of course, well, what should we capture in a transcript? And a lot of that's going to depend on what your purposes are for doing the transcription and what the purposes were and research questions were uh, within doing the actual data collection. And, of course, how is it that we can actually capture those things that we want in the transcript? It's one thing to say, okay, well, a, a transcript can capture certain elements of the social world. How is it that we actually can represent those things in a transcript? Now, one of the key things to understand about transcripts is there's no right way to do transcription. I'm going to show you a number of different things that we can do with a transcript that are different from one another, and those differences really represent different purposes that we might have for doing the transcript. Okay, so let me show you a recording and give you a couple of different ways that it's been transcribed. The first way is going to be a verbatim transcription, and the second way is going to be what we call an approximate transcription. So, yeah, and uh, I suppose uh, while in, in my last few years of teaching, I, I suppose I picked up some of those issues regarding boys' education uh, because, because of the way I tended to focus in the classroom. and. Uh, I tried to really be inclusive and, and probably uh, you know, to address whichever group of students didn't seem to be engaged. It wasn't as much of an issue for me as, uh, it wasn't as obvious an issue as it had become afterwards, standing, standing back at a bit of a distance from it. Okay, so that's the verbatim transcription. You can see that all of the places where he said uh and um all the places where he's tried to what we call self-repair his sentences that means sort of stopping and going back and trying to start the sentence over all the places where he's paused and you can see those in um, parentheses with the period in it 
All of those kinds of things have been included. Now, of course, there's lots of other information that I could have included, but you can see, at, at the very least in this one, I've tried verbatim to get exactly what it is he said. Now, the next one I want to show you, I'll play the uh, recording, and this one is an approximate one that's not necessarily interested in all of those particular details, but that is looking more for direct meaning. So, yeah, and uh, I suppose uh, while in, in my last few years of teaching, I, I suppose I picked up some of those issues regarding boys' education uh, because because of the way I tended to focus in the classroom and. Uh, I tried to really be inclusive and, and probably uh, you know, to address whichever group of students didn't seem to be engaged. It wasn't as much of an issue for me as, uh, it wasn't as obvious an issue as it had become afterwards, standing, standing back at a bit of a distance from it. So you can see here that within this transcription, it's still the same meaning, but I've left out a lot of the other pieces of information within the transcript that I think sort of distract from some of the meaning. Now, it's not that this is good enough for every particular application in qualitative research, but for my purposes, for what I was after, an approximate transcript was fine. In many other cases, a verbatim transcript is the more appropriate choice. So if we're going to design our transcription much like we would design the rest of the study, Edwards, 1993, suggests that we pay attention to three different principles about transcript design that are important to uh, make sure that it's a good transcript. The first part is category design. Now, categories, simply some kind of characteristic of interest. Things like pause time, intonation, volume, anything that we might actually try to mark about a transcript other than just the, the actual words that were said. Now, Edwards talks about categories need, needing to be systematically discriminable, meaning it has to be clear whether the category actually applies to every instance in the data. So, there shouldn't be a point in the data where we have to think uh, in terms of a category about does it apply or does it not apply. It should be very systematic, the discrimination that we can make between the various categories. Also, each category has to be exhaustive. So every case in the data either uh, has to fit into some kind of category. Uh, so there's no pieces of data that are somehow lie outside of the categories that we've set up and they have to be systematically contrasted so that categories must be constructed in such a way that they show the maximum contrast in ways that are important to the analysis. So uh, if we want to, for instance, show emphasis in a particular transcript, we want to actually have emphasis be contrastive uh, to show uh, difference within the transcript so uh, like we could use bold and anything that is emphasis would be bold anything that's not emphasis would not be bold. The second principle of transcript design that Edwards talks about is readability and so if we're going to do a transcript and if our purpose is to be able to actually see on paper what happened in the social world we want readers to be able to get easily through the transcript. And there are a number of different points that go into readability. One thing is the proximity of related events, so that aspects that are closely related to our, each other are actually physically close to one another. So if something happened uh, in chronologically to a particular speech event, it's actually physically located on the page close to what it happened chronologically near. Also, visual separability of unlike events, so that if things are different, they look different. Different types of information look distinctly different. And there's a notion of time-space iconicity, meaning that things that happen earlier appear first on the page, 
and that's true top to bottom, left to right, so that we can understand as we move across the page, reading across the page, that that movement is a movement across time and space. Then there's logical priority. What a reader needs to know first actually comes first. So if the reader needs to know that a particular piece of speech happened uh, quietly, for instance, then we hear in the transcript, or we see in the transcript, quietly, or said quietly, and then we get the actual passage that was said quietly. Then there's the notion of mnemonic marking. So symbols and abbreviations are directly interpretable without much translation, so that we're not choosing uh, transcription symbols and conventions that are somehow hard to interpret or that we need, you know, a, a kind of uh, a list of translations for. Uh, hopefully, if you see that mnemonic marking, you'll be able to understand what it's trying to say. So if something is said with emphasis, uh, then using bold uh, might be a good mnemonic marking because we tend to think of uh, things that are bold as being emphasized anyway, so that's a pretty clearly directly interpretable kind of sim symbol system. Then there's also the notion of efficiency and compactness, so that uh, these uh, the things that mark distinctions are done with as few symbols as possible, so that there's not lots and lots of symbols that have to be interpreted, that take up lots of the page, that as efficiently and as compactly as possible, we want to be able to recognize what a transcription symbol uh, or convention means. And then finally, they talk about computational tractability. And this is particularly important for uh, those people who are using these transcripts on a computer. And particularly if they're using automatic functions on a computer to be able to look through the transcript. So we have to have features in the text systematically marked and that features of the text are standardized so that the computer doesn't either overcount them or undercount them. So anytime you use the word I, for instance, it needs to be capitalized because if the computer is looking for capital I, uh, it'll catch exactly the number that are capitalized. Uh, whereas the computer might miss it if you've not uh, actually capitalized that I. And again, it's especially relevant to anybody using qualitative data analysis software because the computer doesn't know when you've made a mistake in the transcript or when you've done things inconsistently. The computer only looks for what you tell it to look for. Once you've thought through some of these principles of the transcript design, it might be helpful to look at some of the ways in which some of the systems of transcription can differ. Uh, and again, we'll look at Edwards 1993's uh, notions of the, the separation between lots of systems being about spatial arrangement and about the level and type of description. So the first thing is going to be about spatial arrangement. And one of the things that's going to be different from system to system is going to be how we show speakers turns. So in a lot of social situations, of course, people will be talking back and forth, back and forth. Now, oftentimes in an interview, that's not quite that important. But for any kind of situation where you've got speakers taking turns, you have to show how those turns are going to be taken. One of the ways, and this is straight out of uh, Edward's article, is you can use a vertical presentation. So as you go from top to bottom, you'll see that uh, each speaker has a turn going from the top to the bottom. If there's any overlaps, you can see in line B there, uh, then those overlaps will start actually horizontally where those two things overlap. You can also show speakers turns in column form. 
So you can have speaker A all in one column and speaker B all in another column. So you can get a sense when you look from column to column who's dominating particular parts of a conversation. Another way to do it is through what we call partiture, so that uh, where there are overlaps, you'll show those horizontally, but then you'll keep going, and where the first speaker picks up again, you can see that uh, they'll horizontally then appear uh, back in the line of text. So in some ways, it's, it's a very horizontal presentation of the transcript versus uh, that vertical presentation. Also in terms of spatial arrangement, the placement of contextual comments by the transcriptionist, any kind of nonverbal events that have been going on, uh, prosody, which is kind of the qualities of the speech, and any kind of coding can also be put right into a transcript. And this is how some of the systems can differ about where those particular elements are placed. And Edwards talks about there being basically four different choices based on two kind of binary uh, categories. The first is that you can place those elements according to their occurrence in time or attach separately outside of the flow of time as a kind of clarification. Or you can place the contextual comments, nonverbal events, prosody encoding actually within the lines of the utterance or on separate tiers. So it can be kind of chronological is one choice or it can be, uh, and, and the second choice then is where it's actually placed within the utterance. So it can be uh, sort of run in with parentheses or brackets, or it can be actually on separate lines to give uh, that contextual information uh, separately. And here's a good example. So we can have either Mary, quietly, I don't know where I got it, or the line could be Mary, I don't know where I got it. And then on that separate line underneath, quiet, 3.4 seconds. So all that contextual information is either in the sentence interleaved or it's on a separate tier underneath. Now, the second way that transcripts can contrast from one another is through, again, the level and type of description, so how much description is given within the transcript and also the types of descriptions that are given there. The first element is the way we notate words or how we actually show words on the page. So you can either try to phonetically spell out a sneeze by saying achoo, or you can actually in brackets put sneezes. And there's lots of other ways that we might do that uh, with other examples things like different spellings for a word, how uh, it could be sort of, you could make all the, the uh, spellings the standard spellings, or it could be that you spell it phonetically how the person actually pronounced it. Uh, so if uh, a good classic example is people often drop the G off the end of a word. So I'm coming to dinner uh, you could either spell it the standard way and not worry about taking off the G, or you could actually spell it C-O-M-I-N as if uh, that was actually how the person pronounced it. Another difference is the way you break down the units of analysis. Where do you actually separate those utterances and put in periods, make carriage returns, those kinds of things? Are you looking at utterances uh, as uh, actually groups of words between pauses and then you'd put a carriage return between those pauses. Are you doing a kind of standard punctuation where you kind of guess at where the period's supposed to be? It's really easy on the printed page when you're writing a, a document to know where periods are supposed to go. Much more difficult when you're actually listening to somebody because you can't sort of hear or see where those periods are supposed to go. So how do you break up those actual units. Then there are the elements of what we call prosody. So this is the qualities of speech that sort of uh, undergird how the words are actually said. So how do you actually represent breaks in an utterance? So pauses. 
Uh, will you actually measure them? And if so, how will you measure them? Are you going to take a stopwatch and measure the pauses and then sort of indicate exactly how many seconds there will be? Or are you going to just sort of put in brackets pause and, and let that be it? Also, some speakers actually draw out or quickly speak particular words or phrases. And so if someone says, it's going to be a long time before we get home, how are you going to show that they've drawn out that word long? Because there's a really important piece of the meaning that's in there. And so how are you going to represent that meaning in the transcript? Then there's the notion of prominence. Sometimes there's going to be emphasis on a syllable, a word, or a phrase, and it's going to make all the difference to the meaning. So take the same sentence, I swept up the beans, versus I swept up the beans. Just placing that emphasis in there changes the sentence. In the first one, we were going to sweep something, and what we were sweeping was beans. That's the important part, versus I swept up the beans, rather than picking them up one at a time. Same is true for intonation, and that's the rising and falling curve of pitch and volume that people naturally put into their everyday speech. So if we were going to say just a declarative statement, we're going shopping, that's a very flat intonation, maybe even goes down a little bit at the end. If we want to ask a question, though, we have that intonation go up. We're going shopping? Do you see how the pitch of my voice went up at the end? That's how we indicate in speech that there's a question mark there at the end. And how we show that in the transcript might be important. Oftentimes you'll see people actually draw a line or they'll use uh, backslashes or four slashes to be able to show uh, which way the intonation pattern is going. Also we want to know how we're going to show turn taking. And this is a little bit like uh, what we talked about in an earlier slide, but there's a little bit more to it in, than just, you know, is it vertical, horizontal, using partiture, or in columns. Also, turn-taking has a lot more complexities to it and a lot more nuances. So how might we show interruptions? So if somebody is taking their turn and gets cut off by the next speaker, or what if there's a pause between turns? So someone finishes their statement and then there's a long pause and then the next person goes. What about overlaps or any kind of self-corrections if somebody makes a mistake in what they were saying and tries to go back and start the sentence again? How are we going to show those things? And then nonverbal events or actions. What kinds of facial expressions, bodily and other noises, movements and gestures, postures, poses, any events, context, all of these kinds of things can make a big difference in what a speech act actually means. So we'll want to be able to show certain things in a transcript sometimes. What happens, for instance, if the phone rings? Do we actually put that in brackets, phone rings? Uh, or do we not need to really know that for our particular purposes? Sometimes if the phone rings, it's important. Sometimes if the phone rings, it's just a distraction. So we need to make those kinds of uh, decisions, sometimes in advance and sometimes on the fly, about how we're going to actually do the transcription.
You go Okay, now that you've seen the original clip that this transcript comes from, I want to show you a couple of different ways that we might be able to look at how this transcript can be done. Now, all of these, again, are from the same basic clip. Uh, there's a little bit of difference in terms of where the transcript starts, but f all of them come from the same source. So you can look at this one, and this one is a relatively standard transcript. It's got a sort of running text from top to bottom. Uh, now you'll note the use of partiture. Remember we talked about how you can show turn taking and in this case you'll see that the teacher uh, the her line here is going across there's an interruption or an overlap by Lewis and the teacher's uh, speech keeps going. You'll also see that, again, I've chosen to use running text, and relevant context is close to and before the utterances. So, for instance, here where Lewis is speaking, I want to make it clear that he's speaking to Philip. Since there are multiple people interacting in this particular scene, it's important for me, I wanted to make sure that uh, Lewis, uh, who Lewis was talking to, uh, was actually clear, so I would put that in there. You can also see up above a couple of lines uh, that I have a, a transcriber's comment about that Philip is feigning shock, uh, those kinds of things that give a context for what's going on in the video. So this is one very kind of standard way of looking at a transcript, just sort of going top to bottom. Uh, there's left to right chronological and a number of different at the, at the bottom you can see a number of different sort of contextual clues about what's going on where I describe actions and events. Now here's basically the same exact moment but you'll see that I have a lot of columns in here. Some of the columns are for lines but then in the uh, second column there we have message units uh, or transcript text. So this is basically whenever someone speaks, I put it in that particular column. In the third column over, you'll see there are gestural cues or sort of uh, motions and uh, other kinds of events that people are doing. Then I have a couple of different columns over all the way to the right where I do some coding. Now this, I'm not going to go into exactly what the coding is here, but I've put in a number of different symbols for different things that are going on within the video. And two things that I'm particularly coding are for resistance moves and identity moves. And so anywhere where in the transcript I feel as if uh, either resistance work or identity work is going on, 
I would put in those particular codes. So you can see this is a very different way of doing the transcript, having these columns going on, but there's still a kind of chronological top to bottom, left to right kind of momentum in this transcript. Now the third one I want to show you is quite different, but it's still got the same design elements that the previous two transcripts have with the addition of a couple of uh, other things. Okay, so here's that other transcript. Uh, now you'll notice that right away this is a pretty recognizable form. This is what we would call uh, sequential art or comic book page or a graphic novel page, that kind of thing. And you can see exactly how I've done it. I've taken still frames right out of the video and put them into the boxes. I've used a comic book creation program called Comic Life that's just on the Macintosh computer. And I've added in the actual words that people have used. And instead of putting in all of the contextual cues that I had had to put in in the text, you can actually see in some of the panels the actual motions and gestures that uh, Philip and some of his compatriots are using. Uh, and it still has a lot of the same kinds of design elements, again, that, uh, that uh, Edwards talks about in terms of uh, categories and uh, other design elements, uh, readability, those kinds of things, because uh, it goes uh, with the viewers eye mo movements uh, chronologically uh, so you can see all of the same kinds of lines are in here the various types of balloons signal various distinctions in prosody uh, so for instance in that top right panel you can see that dotted balloon uh, that's indecipherable speech because it's very quiet and that dotted balloon uh, sort of instantly tells you that it's uh, sort of quieter speech whereas uh, some of the balloons like in the fourth panel there oh it is uh, you can see it's kind of excitement and emphasis so there's a lot of ways that we can show those prosodic elements uh, with this uh, comic book form uh, you can also see between the lines there are some footnotes uh, and this is a very sort of common thing within uh, comic books as well to have these sort of editorial notes between lines uh, so I've used some of those. There's narration boxes uh, where it says then the teacher walks away and those kinds of things. Now I've talked a little bit more about this in an article uh, for a uh, book collection on uh, graphic novels and comics in the classroom uh, and you're welcome to read more about that. There's the uh, citation down there at the bottom of the screen. But again, uh, as you look across, your eyes go chronologically across the page so it's the same kinds of elements that Edwards is talking about in the article about uh, how there's a kind of uh, time-space uh, iconography that, that happens. Uh, iconicity, I think, is uh, the, the phrase that she uses. So you can see in these particular transcripts three different versions of the way that we can design transcription of the same exact event. So there's no one way, as I said, of making a transcript, but there are some certain design principles for any transcript that one needs to pay attention to. Uh, so as long as you uh, have readability in mind, categories in mind, uh, and for those of you who are going to be using uh, computer analysis, that uh, computational tractability in mind, uh, any way you go about it should do just fine. So again, the key thing to remember is that all transcripts have to solve certain problems for you. You have to sh be able to show the notation of words. How is it that some things that aren't standard uh, can be made into something that can be shown on a page? You have to think about how to show the unit of analysis. Where are the line breaks? Uh, what are the, uh, you know, what counts as a paragraph versus just a sentence. You have to take into account prosodics or the sound quality of those utterances including intonation, pauses, prominence, all sorts of kind of sound quality issues. Also turn-taking. Where do you show 
places where people overlap and interrupt each other, how do you kind of put them on the page so that you can see how close they are together and where there are pauses or where things uh, are, are latched together? And also kinesics, or the kind of gestures and context that surround an event in the social world. So key questions to ask are, when you're trying to decide these things, what do I need to do with the transcript? Uh, you know, if you're not ever going to actually analyze uh, pauses, then why record them, right? So figuring out what it is you actually want to be able to do with it is, is particularly key. What do you need to analyze? Do you need to analyze gestures? Uh, do you need to analyze places where someone's making a kind of hand movement, that kind of thing? You'll remember in Philip's case in the video with uh, all of those students sitting around, he makes a number of diff different hand gestures that kind of connect him to a particular group of people and a, a particular kind of identity that he wants to present to the camera. So for me, analyzing those hand gestures was crucial. If you're just doing an interview and what you're trying to get is the content of the interview, you may not need to actually have those things. And also, when you get to actually writing out the report, what is it you want to be able to say? If you don't have the data from the transcript, then you're not going to be able to talk about things like pauses or self-corrections, any of those kinds of issues. If you've recorded it, then you can talk about it. If you haven't, you can't. Now, whatever way you decide to transcribe, it's very important that you give your reader a key for how to actually read the transcript. Now, sometimes it's going to be pretty apparent how to actually do it, but there are certain things that you're not going to be able to do in just regular standard words. So there are certain transcription conventions that you might use uh, to show particular types of prosodics, uh, particular gestures, uh, those kinds of things. And here's some common ones. Uh, the use of the degree symbol around text uh, can often mean quietly spoken utterance or whispering. You can put things in brackets, and that's normally commentary by the transcriptionist. Uh, oftentimes, for me, if I can't actually decipher what somebody's saying because the sound quality is too poor or there was some kind of overlapping noise, I'll put uh, three X's in a parenthesis to indicate it's indecipherable. Uh, oftentimes, people will laugh. How do you transcribe laughter? Uh, well, I usually just use a series of H's to show that somebody is, uh, is, some, is laughing. Uh, if somebody has dropped an utterance, in other words, they've stopped in the middle of what they were saying or it's incomplete, I'll put uh, a dash at the end or two hyphens. If I want to show emphasis, normally I'll put all caps. That stands out a little bit better for me than the actual uh, like bolding or italics, those kinds of things. I can see all caps scanning down a page much more easily than I can uh, those other kinds of uh, graphic uh, ways of showing emphasis. Uh, if I want to show a prolonged sounding of a word, uh, remember I gave that example sentence of, you know, it's going to be a long time. So if I want to show that a word has been stretched out, I'll put uh, two colons right in the middle of it, and you can kind of graphically see that that's stretched the word out. If I want to show a slight pause, I'll put a period in uh, parentheses. If I want to show a long pause, I'll actually put the uh, the number in there, and usually I'll put that in either parentheses or have dashes around it or something like that. And the actual number is the number of seconds that the pause lasted. And then finally, if two lines have been conjoined or quickly follow one another, so basically as soon as one person stops speaking, another person starts right away, uh, then I'll put that equal sign at the end of one line and the beginning of the next. Now these are some pretty common transcription conventions. You can come up with uh, whatever kind of uh, symbols that you want to as long as both you can understand them, your reader can understand them, and you have uh, a description of what your particular conventions are going to be and put those right there in the methodology section. 
So in general, I've given you a lot of different things that you have to kind of decide uh, when it comes to transcribing. So I have a uh, transcription decisions chart that I put together. And you can see that uh, it kind of you go down the list and answer these questions in order, uh, answering each of these sort of heuristics. And uh, if you have, uh, when you get to this answer about how detailed the transcript needs to be, you know, for a linguistic analysis, uh, all of those prosodics are going to be vitally important. For most people who are doing just a simple content analysis of what someone is saying, all of those kinds of hesitations and false starts and fillers, uh, abandoned phrases, that kind of stuff, you don't really necessarily need that. That's more for a linguistic kind of thing. So you can go with the, the content analysis type things. Uh, but, you know, kind of going through this chart hopefully can help you answer some of the questions about how to go about designing your transcription. Again, a key understanding is that the decisions you make about transcribing impact how you're going to conduct your research and how others are actually going to read it too. Readability is one of those key design decisions and how you go about transcribing is going to impact how people perceive your research. So there's some transcription software and I have a whole separate video that I'm going to show you about how to use transcription software. I'm going to show you a uh, particular package called Hypertranscribe. But that's in the next video. Thanks for watching this video and I hope you have a successful time designing your transcription.